Welcome back to the session, everyone. Hope all of you guys are back after the lunch break. Just put a confirmation in the chat. So you guys are back so that we can move forward in our session. Is everyone back, guys? Yes, OK, I can see a confirmation from Akshit. All right, fine, so let's resume. So guys, just before the break, I showed you how to create a model from scratch without Azure. And if you want to create a model with Azure, you can do that as well. So we saw how to do, uh, how to create machine learning model with Azure. Here, what it will, what it will do guys is, uh, since we asked it to create model for classification scenario, it will apply all the algorithms and it will show you that, okay, with this algorithm, what is the score? With knife base algorithm, what is the score? With some other algorithm, what is the score? That's why it is taking time. As you can see, it's still, uh, the training is still in progress. The reason for this is, uh, it is training on all the algorithms, okay? And then it will show you that, okay, on which algorithm is working best for your data, all right? Here, I'll just adjust uh, my charger. It seems there is some issue in my motherboard because the charging is not properly working. Okay, in between, uh, it keeps on getting disconnected. Okay, anyways, and now it seems it is connected, so let's move forward. So uh, till uh, our model is being trained by Azure, till the, that time, let's go ahead and let's learn more concepts related to machine learning which can be asked in your DP100 examination. So guys, one algorithm has been covered by us. Does anybody remember the name of that algorithm? What was the name of that algorithm, guys? Just want to confirm whether you, have, whether you know the name of that algorithm or not. What was the name of the algorithm that we covered just before the break? Akshit has given the correct answer. It was called multinomial knife base. Now let's look at one such algorithm okay a similar algorithm compared to naive base this algorithm is called k nearest neighbors the name of this algorithm is k nearest neighbors i'll open these slides and through these slides i'll try to explain that algorithm to you one second Let me open these slides properly. Okay. So let's talk about K nearest neighbors. So you might tell me that, okay, multinomial knife base was used for creating a supervised learning model. What is this algorithm used for? So guys, this algorithm is also used for creating a supervised learning model. Then you might tell me that, okay, multinomial knife based was used to create which type of supervised learning model, classification or regression? So classification, right? Multinomial knife base was used for classification purposes. Similarly, K nearest neighbors is also used for classification purposes, okay? So just like multinomial knife base was used for classification purposes, even K nearest neighbors algorithm is used for classification purposes. Let's see how it works. So if I want to create a machine learning model with this algorithm, I will need some data first of all, right? So let's suppose I have my data. In my data, I have three columns, experience, age, and gender. Out of these three columns, the first two columns, experience and age, are my feature columns, let's say. And the last column, which is gender, is my target column. Okay. And here is the data shown to you on your screen. Now, remember guys, uh, currently in this data, the first two columns are my feature column. The last column is my target column. The values of the target column are also known as labels. Okay. Another term that is used for them is labels. So all of these are called labels. So you can call them target column values. You can call them labels, one and the same thing. Okay. So what I will do guys is currently, can I say all the four rows that I have with me are labeled rows, right? They are rows containing labels. So I will call them labeled rows. So for these labeled rows, I will plot a graph, okay? So let me go ahead and let me plot this data onto a graph. Remember I will plot it in such a way 
that those points that have a gender value of male will be colored in red, whereas those points that have a gender value of female will be colored in blue. Okay, so let me go ahead and let me plot that graph. Okay, so looking at the first row of the data, I'll plot the first point. Looking at second row of the data, I'll plot the second point. Looking at third row of the data, I'll plot the third point. And looking at fourth row of the data, I'll plot fourth point. So here, guys, since I had four labeled rows, using those four labeled rows, I plotted four labeled points onto the graph. Okay, using those four labeled rows, I plotted four labeled points onto the graph. Now, let's say I want to create a machine learning model for some purpose. Which purpose is a machine learning model used for? Only two purposes, either for inference or for prediction. So let's say I want to create a machine learning model for prediction. Okay, so I want to predict that if the age of a person is 22 years and the experience of that person is one year, then what is the gender of that person? Okay, fine. So let's see how to do it. So guys, this row that I have with me, is it a labeled row or an unlabeled row? Is it a labeled row or an unlabeled row? What do you think, guys? Labels are nothing but your target column values. Okay. So this row, does it have target column value? No. So it is an unlabeled row. Right, as Akshit has mentioned in the chat, it's an unlabeled row. So, for this unlabeled row, as even Shiv has mentioned in the chat, the last row is an unlabeled row. So, for this unlabeled row, let me plot an unlabeled point onto the graph. Okay, I've done that. Fine. Now, let's go ahead and let's see how this algorithm of K and N will work. Full form of K and N is K nearest neighbors. Let's go ahead and let's see how it works. So, guys, the first step is to choose the number of neighbors. So let's suppose I'm choosing number of neighbors equal to three. Let's assume that I'm choosing number of neighbors equal to three. Then moving on to step number two. Step number two is depending on the number of neighbors, I will choose that many closest labeled points with respect to the unlabeled data point. So guys, we know this is my unlabeled data point, right? For this unlabeled row, we had plotted this unlabeled data point. Okay. So with respect to this unlabeled data point, I have to select some closest labeled data points. How many closest labeled data points I will select? Well, it depends on the number of neighbors. How many numbers, how many number of neighbors did I select in my step number one? I selected three number of neighbors. That's why I will select three closest labeled data points with respect to the unlabeled data point. So with respect to the unlabeled data point over here. I will select three closest labeled data points. Okay, so let me do that. So over here you can see with respect to my unlabeled data point, I've selected three closest labeled data points. Okay, step number two is done. Moving on to step number three, which is to make all of the selected label points to vote. Your red points will vote red, blue points will vote blue. I have selected three labeled points. All of these three labeled points will vote. So two votes will go to red and one vote will go to blue. So your step number three has also been done. Now moving on to step number four, which is the last step. So last step guys, is that based on majority of the votes, you will assign a label to the unlabeled data point. So here I have my unlabeled data point. To my unlabeled data point, I will assign a label based on majority of the votes. So majority of the votes have gone to which color? Shiv, can you answer that buddy? Shiv, majority of the votes have gone to which color? Have a look on your screen. Red, right? Majority of the votes have gone to red. That's why this unlabeled data point will be labeled as red. Unlabeled data point will be labeled as red, as you can see. Red color stands for which target value? While making the graph, I had made that announcement. That red color stands for which target value, blue color stands for which target value. As you guys have correctly mentioned in the chat, red color here stands for male target value. That means I'm predicting that the target value for this particular row will be equal to male. Okay. And you can see same thing has been mentioned in this slide over here. It has predict we have predicted that target value for this particular row is equal to male. 
So this is how KNN algorithm works and make predictions for you. Okay. So this is our second algorithm. Now we saw these steps. There were four steps. You should have a doubt based on these four steps. Any doubt you have, you should have a doubt. And based on the doubt, we'll proceed ahead. You should have a doubt. There was something um, that shouldn't make sense about these four steps. Huh. Akshit says, what if we select four number of neighbors? Will it affect our overall prediction? Yes. So guys, selecting neighbors is very, very important. Okay, selecting correct number of neighbors is very, very important. Let me show you an example. Let's suppose I have a graph like this, wherein I have an unlabeled data point in the middle. And with respect to that unlabeled data point, I'm choosing three closest labeled data points. So what I'll do is I'll make all of these three closest labeled data points to vote. Brown points will vote brown. Green points will vote green. Here, majority of the votes will go to brown, right? That is why the unlabeled data point in the middle will be labeled as brown. The unlabeled data point in the middle will be labeled as brown. And you can see that over here. Okay. Let's take an example. Let's suppose I'm choosing a different number of neighbors. Instead of three number of neighbors, I'm choosing five number of neighbors. So now I will select five closest labeled data points. All of these five closest labeled data points will vote. Brown points will vote brown. Green points will vote green. Here, guys, you tell me, Akshit, majority of the votes will go to which color? Now that number of neighbors is five. Now, majority of the votes are going to which color? Green, as you have mentioned, right? So that means that means the unlabeled data point in the middle will be labeled as green. And you can see over here, the unlabeled data point in the middle has been labeled as green. So with different number of neighbors, you are getting different predictions. So choosing correct number of neighbors is very important. How to choose correct number of neighbors? Let's see that. Okay. So the main point is how to choose correct number of neighbors. So guys, the point that I'm making is there will be some algorithms where there is no setting required at all. For example, if you remember the algorithm that we covered before the lunch break, multinomial knife base, it did not require any setting. Whereas here, KNN algorithm requires an important setting choosing correct number of neighbors. Okay. So some algorithms will require you to pass that setting. Okay. Some algorithms will not have any setting at all. Like for example, multinomial naive bias. I mean, it has a fixed steps. That's it. Okay. You don't have to uh, go ahead and pass certain value for a setting. Nothing like that. Okay. And probably that's the only algorithm that is without a setting, guys. Okay. All the algorithms that you see going forward will have some settings in them. So you will have to pass correct value for those settings. By the way, guys, these settings are known as parameters. Okay. These algorithm settings are known as parameters of the algorithm. So you call them parameters, you call them settings, one and the same thing. And the process to find the correct value is called hyperparameter tuning. The process to find correct value for a parameter is called hyperparameter tuning. Now, just the announcement straightforward that uh, is this a foolproof approach? Hyperparameter tuning, as I mentioned, is a process to find a good value for a parameter. Is it a foolproof approach? Will it always give you the best parameter value out there? No, it's not a foolproof approach. There is no approach available in the market that will give you the best value for a parameter. Okay. But yes, we have one approach hyperparameter tuning. Let's see how it works. Okay. Um, even that is not foolproof. Even hyperparameter tuning is not foolproof. But still, let's see how it works over here. So what I will do is I will open up a whiteboard. And through the whiteboard, I will try to explain you this concept of hyperparameter tuning. Okay, so what did I just say, guys? That there will be some algorithms that do not require you to do any setting at all. There will be some algorithms that require you to do some setting. For example, multinomial naive base was one such algorithm wherein you did not have to do any setting at all. Whereas KNN is an algorithm where you have to do a setting. What is that setting? One important setting is 
choosing correct number of neighbors. Okay. So what are the settings involved in KNM? Let me mention that. What are the settings involved or what are the parameters involved in KNM? So the first setting is choosing correct number of neighbors. Number of neighbors is one setting. Okay. What could be another setting? So guys, when you will implement the KNN algorithm, okay, fine. For step number one, you need to pass correct number of neighbors, right? So that is something that you will do. That is your first setting. Once you have chosen the number of neighbors, you will select that many closest labeled points, right? For example, if you have selected three number of neighbors, that, then you will choose three closest labeled data points, right? If you have uh, chosen five number of neighbors, then you will uh, select five closest labeled data points and so on. So how to know which labeled point is closer and which labeled point is far away? You will say by calculating distance. And there are multiple distance formulas, guys, that you can use to calculate distance. So at the time of algorithm implementation, you will have to specify which distance formula you want to use to calculate distance. Okay. Let me show you some of the most popular distance formulas that you can use over here. Okay, let me show you some of the most popular distance formulas. I will explain that to you over here. So distance formula is another setting. Let me explain some of the important distance formulas out there. Okay. So as far as distance formula is concerned, guys, there are many distance formulas. Let me show you two of the most important ones. One is Manhattan distance formula. And other is Euclidean distance formula. What is the difference between Manhattan distance and Euclidean distance? Let's see. So guys, in case of one feature column, Let us let me call that feature column X. In case of one feature column, how will you calculate distance between the data points? So in case of one feature column, we will use a formula like this. In case of Manhattan, it will be modulus of X2 minus X1. Okay, it will be modulus of X2 minus X1. That is how you will calculate distance between two points in case of one feature column. Okay, that is for Manhattan distance formula. What about Euclidean? In Euclidean distance formula, what you do is instead of uh, uh, using modulus, you use something called square. And that entire term you will divide, I mean, uh, that, that entire term you will take the square root of that entire term. This is in case of one feature column. Similarly, in case of two feature columns, let me call them X and Y. How will the formulas look like? So Manhattan formula looks something like this. It is X2 minus X1 plus Y2 minus Y1. Whereas in case of two feature columns, how will the Euclidean distance formula look like? So it will be square root of X2 minus X1 the whole square plus Y2 minus Y1 the whole square. In case of three feature columns, let me call those three feature columns X, Y, and Z. In that scenario, how does how do these formulas look like? Let's talk about Euclidean. Uh, let's talk about Manhattan formula first. So, in case of three feature columns, it will be modulus of X2 minus X1 plus modulus of Y2 minus Y1 plus modulus of Z2 minus Z1. Okay, and in case of three feature columns. Let me call them X, Y, and Z. And in case of three feature columns, how does the Euclidean formula look like? It will be square root of X2 minus X1, the whole square, plus Y2 minus Y1, the whole square, plus Z2 minus Z1, the whole square. Okay. So guys, over here, I have mentioned about two most important distance formulas, Manhattan and Euclidean. Okay. I have shown you that in case of one feature column, how will the form of, uh, formulas look like? 
in case of two feature columns, how will the formulas look like? In case of three feature columns, how will the formulas look like? Similarly, if you have more uh, feature columns, the formula will keep on changing. I, I guess by now you have an idea of how the formulas look like. Okay, fine. So this was about distance formula. So guys, within KNN algorithm, there are two settings that you as a user will have to select. First is you will have to select number of neighbors. Second is you will have to select distance formula. How will I know which number of neighbors to choose? How will I know which distance formula to choose? So guys, these two things, number of neighbors, distance formula, these are the settings in the KNN algorithm. These are the parameters in the KNN algorithm. In order to find the best value for a parameter, is there any approach in the foolproof approach in the market? No, there is no approach available in the market that is foolproof. But yes, people, uh, ML engineers do try to use one approach, which is called hyperparameter tuning. Again, it's not foolproof, but let me show you how it works. Let me show you how hyperparameter tuning works. Hyperparameter tuning. So just the announcement that there is no technique available in the market that is a foolproof technique to give me the best value for a parameter. Okay. Uh, however, still machine learning engineers do try to prefer this uh, technique of hyperparameter tuning. Even it is not foolproof, but let's see how it works. There are again different methods of hyperparameter tuning. One is called grid search approach. Another is called random search approach. Let me explain them over to you. All right. So guys, let's talk about grid search. So in grid search hyperparameter tuning, how does it work? So in KNN, there are two important settings. Guys, can anyone mention those two important settings in the KNN algorithm? What are the two important settings? What are the parameters of the KNN algorithm for which you have to pass values? Only Shiv and Akshit are giving answers. What about other guys? So what are the important settings in the KNN algorithm? Akshit mentions one is number of neighbors, second is distance formula, right? Okay, fine. So let's suppose I want to find the correct value for it. How will I do it? Okay, let me show that to you. So number of neighbors is one. And distance formula is another setting. So guys, what are the steps in grid search hyperparameter tuning? Let's go ahead and let's try to understand it. Okay, I'll show you the steps over here. Over here, I'll just uh, show these steps. One second. Okay, fine. Let's go ahead. So let me mention the steps of grid search hyperparameter tuning. So guys, the first step of grid search hyperparameter tuning is to shortlist parameter values. Okay, so shortlist values for your parameters. So first step is to shortlist values for your parameters. Now, how to shortlist? It depends on two things. One, trial and error, error approach. Second, it depends on experience. So for example, let's say if you want to switch on a TV. Okay, let's say you want to switch on a TV. Now, based on your experience, you know na, that, okay, when I switch on the TV, uh, what happens is uh, it's better to keep the volume at 50%. Okay, uh, otherwise what will happen is the volume will be too loud and so on. Okay. Now, I uh, will come back and show the explanation. Uh, let me just go to my uh, door. Somebody has rang the bell. So, I'll just come back in two minutes, guys, okay? And I'll continue with the explanation. Give me two minutes.
Okay, sorry for the interruption, guys. So the mate was ringing the bell. All right. Uh, continuing with our explanation of grid search hyperparameter tuning. First step is to shortlist values for the parameters, right? Uh, now, how to shortlist values? Just based on two things. One, your trial and error approach that you try with different values and see how it is working. Second, it be it is based on your experience. Okay, sometimes you might feel that okay on previous data it worked on some previous data, and there on that data these parameter values had worked well. Now this current data that I'm working on is similar to the previous one. So even on the current data, let's apply the same parameter values. Okay, so in order to shortlist values for the parameters, it's only based on two things: first, trial and error approach; second, based on your experience. Okay, so using these two things, you have to shortlist values. After shortlisting values, you will try to create a model with every possible combination of parameter values, with every possible combination of parameter values. Okay, fine. So second step is to create a model with every possible combination of parameter values. Then the third step is to check which model is performing the best. Okay, so we'll look at the accuracy of the model and we'll see which model is performing the best. Uh, once we find which model is performing the best, then we will take a look at the parameters used in that best model. Okay, so for example, let's say we created models for every possible combination of parameter values. Let's say 10 models were created. Out of 10 models, model number eight was the best performing one. So we'll see in model number eight, which parameter values were used and that those are our, uh, those are our good parameter values. Okay, so step number four is to take the parameter values used in the best model. Okay, fine. So these are the steps of uh, grid search hyperparameter tuning. Okay, so let's try to implement those steps over here. Okay, so for number of neighbors, I will try to shortlist some values. So guys, you give me some values for number of neighbors, anything of your choice. You give me some values. Akshit or Shiv or Akhilesh. You guys can give me some values for number of neighbors. Give me any values of your choice. Any values because first step is to shortlist values for parameters, right? So for number of neighbors parameter, I will shortlist values for distance formula. I will shortlist something. Okay. Achilles says three. All right. Then somebody says four. Somebody says five. Okay. Three, four, five is what you're mentioning. Okay. Not an issue. Then distance formula. Uh, there are many distance formula. I've explained two to you. So let's suppose I'm shortlisting those two. Those two. So Manhattan distance formula is one. And Euclidean distance formula is another. Okay. So we are, what we have done is we have shortlisted values for these parameters. Right. We have shortlisted values for these parameters. Okay. And you can see after shortlisting values, this structure that you see over here looks like a grid. Okay. It looks like a grid basically. That is why uh, this is known as grid search hyperparameter tuning. Okay. It's known as what? It is known as grid search hyperparameter tuning. It looks like a grid. That's why it's known as grid search hyperparameter tuning. Okay, first step done. We had shortlisted the values. Second step, create a model with every possible combination. Okay, so model one will be created with distance formula equal to Manhattan and uh, number of neighbors equal to three. Then model two will be created with distance formula equal to Manhattan and number of neighbors equal to four. Then model three will be created with distance formula equal to Manhattan and number of neighbors equal to five. Then model six will be, sorry, model four will be created with uh, distance formula equal to Euclidean and number of neighbors equal to three and so on. Like this total, six models will be created. 
with every possible combination of parameter values. Then third step is to check which model is performing the best. So let's suppose model one give me 90% accuracy. Model two give me 80%. Model three give me 70%, let's say. Model four give me 95%. Model 5 give me 88% and model 6 give me 82% accuracy. So here we need to focus on the best performing model. Model 4 over here is the best performing model. It's the model having the highest accuracy. So step number 4 and the last step is to take the parameter values used in the best model. So here my model number 4 is the best model. The parameter values used in this best model are for distance formula, what is the best parameter value? Euclidean. For number of neighbors, which is the best parameter value? Three. Okay. So this is how grid search hyperparameter tuning works. But based on the working, you yourself tell me, guys, is this a foolproof approach? Will it always give you the best parameter value out there? Yes, it results in a good parameter value. But is it a foolproof approach? No, right? As you have mentioned in the chat. It's not a foolproof approach. Okay. So grid. Uh, so uh, there is no technique available in the market that is a foolproof approach through which you can find the best value for a parameter. But still machine learning engineers do try to use hyperparameter tuning. I have shown you one approach of hyperparameter tuning grid search. Okay, fine. Uh, here guys, what had happened in grid search is six possible models were created, right? Uh, let's suppose I shortlist more parameters. With that, more models will be created. Here guys, in these on your screen, you can see that for number of neighbors, I had selected three possible values. For distance formula, I had selected two possible values. That's why six models were created. Okay. On the other hand, let's say if for number of neighbors, I select 10 uh, 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 shortlisted values. For distance formula, I select three, uh, let's say, uh, different distance formulas. Then how many models will be created? 30 models. Creating those 30 models will be very tedious. Okay. It will increase your computation time. It will increase your computation cost. So to avoid that, guys, random search hyperparameter tuning was made. Okay. In random search hyperparameter tuning, what you do is, instead of creating a model on all the possible combination, you only create a model on random parameter values. Okay. So instead of creating models with all the possible combination in random search hyperparameter tuning, you create a model only on random parameter values. Okay. So with this, uh, let's say uh, out of uh, the 10 parameter value shortlisted, it, it is only create, it is only choosing two. Out of the three uh, parameter values selected for distance, it is only selecting two. So like this, what will happen? It will lead to lesser number of models getting created. That is what happens in random search. But it is even a, I mean, it's a, it's a worse approach than even grid search. Okay, fine. I have shown you random search, but it's even worse than grid search. Okay, because uh, yes, random search randomly chooses the parameter values on which it wants to work. The other parameter values it will neglect. What if those parameter values that it has neglected are good parameter values? There's nothing you can do about it. So random search is even worse than grid search. Okay. So just to recap, guys, after the break, we talked about a second algorithm of the day, KNN. In KNN, there are two important settings that you as a user will have to do. First setting is to choose number of neighbors. Second set setting is to choose the distance formula. So how to choose correct number of neighbors? How to choose correct distance formula? Is there a way available in the market that can give me the best value for these settings, best value for these parameters. There is no foolproof way out there. Still, machine learning engineers do try to prefer this approach of hyperparameter tuning. Even hyperparameter tuning is not foolproof. There are many approaches of hyperparameter tuning. One is grid search, other is random search, and so on. Okay. So, this is how about hyperparameter tuning, guys. Uh, based on hyperparameter tuning, you will get one question asked in your DP100 examination. One question is fixed. Okay, so based on this explanation that you see on your screen, one question is fixed to come. All right, fine. So just to recap over here, okay. Uh, before the lunch break, we talked about an algorithm called multinomial naive base. 
after the lunch break, I talked about an algorithm called KNN. Let's go ahead and let's see how KNN uh, should be implemented. So I'll open a coding file and I'll show you how to implement it. Let's see with code how to implement it. Saravanan has a doubt over here. Saravanan says, can you explain MDOM? What do you mean by MDOM? What? MDOM. Mention the full form, buddy. Achha, random. Achha, random search, you mean? Achha, achha. Haan, okay. Fine. I'll, yeah, I will explain again. Sure. Okay. So let me explain that to you. Okay, that RN looked like M to me. Okay, that's why I was confused. Okay, so here let's talk about random search. So I'll compare the two side by side to you. Hyperparameter tuning. There are two approaches, grid search and random search. There are other approaches also, but these two are the, are the ones widely used. What are the steps of grid search hyperparameter tuning? Let's go ahead and let's understand that over here. So in grid search hyperparameter tuning, if you guys remember, we had these steps. I'll just copy it and paste it over here. Okay, it did not paste it properly. Why? Okay, let me copy like this and then paste it. Huh, okay. So these are the steps of grid search hyperparameter tuning, right? Now in random search hyperparameter tuning, what happens is, so uh, instead of considering all the parameter values and creating a model with every possible combination of parameter values, in random search, what you do is you only create model on, you only create a model with random combination of parameter values, not with all combination. You create a model with random combination of parameter values. Okay, fine. So uh, what I will do is, um, let me show that to you side by side. So let me talk about KNN. In KNN, there are two parameters or two settings, right? One is number of neighbors. And second is distance formula. Second is distance formula. Okay. So let's say uh, for number of neighbors, we are shortlisting values. Let's say the values are three, uh, six, and nine. For distance formula, I've shortlisted some formulas. Let's suppose one formula that I've shortlisted is Manhattan. Another formula that I've shortlisted is Euclidean. There are others also, but these two are the ones that are widely used and they are more reliable. Okay, fine. And you can see after shortlisting the parameter values, this sort of a grid like structure is made. That's why this is known as grid search hyperparameter tuning. Okay. This is known as grid search hyperparameter tuning. Fine. So let's go ahead and let's see how it works over here. Okay. Uh, so in grid search hyperparameter tuning, uh, what we do is we create a model with every possible combination of parameter values. So we might create a model with, let's say, uh, distance formula equal to Manhattan and number of neighbors equal to three. My model number two will be created with distance formula equal to Manhattan and number of neighbors equal to six. Model three will be created with distance formula equal to Manhattan and number of neighbors equal to nine and so on. Like this, in grid search hyperparameter tuning, total six models will be created. Whereas on the other hand, if I talk about random search guys, then let me show you in random search what will happen. Random search will not create a model with every possible combination of parameter values. It will only create a model with random combination of parameter values. Okay, so let me show that to you. 
Okay. So let's suppose I'm shortlisting some values over here. Same values, let me shortlist. Okay. I've shortlisted same values over here. Fine, let's move forward. In random search, what happens? Unlike grid search, which creates a model on every possible combination of parameters, here in random search, the model is created only on a uh, random combination, not on all combination. Okay. So what might happen is let's say out of distance formula, it randomly selects Manhattan. Out of number of neighbors, it randomly selects this value, three and nine. So what will happen over here? Only two models will be created. Model number one will be with number of neighbors, with will be with distance formula equal to Manhattan and number of neighbors equal to three. Model number two will be with distance formula equal to Manhattan and number of neighbors equal to nine. Okay, so here in random search, what you're doing is you're creating less number of models with that two advantages. Your computation cost will reduce, your computation time will reduce. But the disadvantage is that random search misses out on some parameter values, right? It uh, only works on few parameter values, other, uh, other parameter values it ignores. So what if the parameter value that it has ignored is a good parameter value. There's nothing you can do about it in random search. So the disadvantage is that random search may sometimes ignore good parameter values out there. Okay. So uh, if you are short on time and cost, fine, you can go for random search. Okay. If, um, if time and cost then is not a factor for you, then you should go for grid search. Is there any other approach available in the market that is better than any of these approaches that I've shown you? No. So hyperparameter tuning approach is used widely by machine learning engineers. As I declared, it's not foolproof. Okay. And none of the approaches available in the market are foolproof. But this, um, if you had to select a technique to arrive at the best parameter value, this is what you can do. Okay. Uh, so there is a whole... Uh, uh, library, the, in that library, uh, there is ready-made code available for hyperparameter tuning. You can use that code uh, to perform it. Okay, fine. Now, Saravanan says, in random, can we set number of random models? Yes, yes, you can do that. So you can do those settings. By default, it only does it on, uh, it only creates two by default, but huh, you can change it. You can mention that, okay, randomly create three models or five models, whatever you want. By default, it creates two. Okay. But huh, you can change it, guys. Okay, so in that library that I talked about, you can change it. Okay, so I think you're talking about that library that, huh, in that, can we specify that, okay, these are the number of models I want to build. So, huh, we can do that. Okay, fine. Oh, that was your doubt, right, Saravanan? Mid it was clear or something else you are asking? If your question is, can we mention uh, how many models to be created with random search? Yes, you can mention. Okay. Saravanan tells me in the chat that, okay, doubt is clear. Fine. All right. So this was about grid search and random search. Okay. And now let's go ahead, guys. If you want, I can paste the link of this. This is that you can access the link only through your uh, personal ID. Don't use your corporate ID because it might have certain firewalls. Okay, if you want this whiteboard link, then you can get it. All right, now let's go ahead. So guys, just to recap, before the lunch break, I talked about an algorithm called multinomial knife base. After the lunch break, I talked about an algorithm called K-nearest neighbors. Before the lunch break, I showed you the theory of multinomial knife base as well as implementation of multinomial knife base. Now, after the lunch break, now that I've showed you theory of KNN, let me also show you implementation of KNN. So guys, KNN is what? At the end of the day, it's a supervised learning model, right? So the steps to implement it will remain the same. Steps to implement any supervised learning algorithm will remain the same. Okay, so let me get my data over here. So let's suppose I have some data to work with. 
let's suppose I have data about iris flowers. So what has happened is uh, scientists have gone to the jungle and recorded information about iris flowers. So they have recorded information about 150 iris flowers. And here you will be able to see that information in this data shortly. And here you can see it. So they have recorded information about 150 iris flowers. And what information have they recorded? They have recorded information about species of the iris flower. They have recorded information about the petal width, petal length, sepal width, sepal length, and then the ID of that flower. That was, was it the first flower that they were recording or the second flower, or the third flower, and so on. Okay, so this is my data. It is about iris flowers. Here, let's suppose, guys, species column is my target column. You are in species, there are only three possibilities. Either you will have iris setosa, which is one species of iris. Either you will have iris versicolor, which is second species of iris. Or either you will have iris virginica, which is the third species of iris flower. Okay. Fine. So here I have three possibilities in my target. So I have finite set of possibilities in my target. So my model will be a classification model. And luckily, the algorithm that we just talked about a few minutes back, KNN, is used for classification purposes only. So it, it could be perfect for our data. Okay, fine. Let's go ahead. So let's implement it. First step, data should be clean. There should be no spelling mistake. There should be no missing values. Here on checking the missing values, I observe that, yes, there are no missing values in my data. I don't think there are any spelling mistakes as well. Okay. Second step, extract features and target. Okay. So here my target column, as I mentioned to you, is this last column called species. And all the columns apart from target will be my potential feature columns. They are not my final feature columns. They are my potential feature columns. Then I will decide within those potential feature columns, which column is worthy to become a feature, which is not. Okay. So let's look, let's have a look at the potential feature columns. And here you can see total five feature columns. Is there any column that you feel is not worthy to become a feature? Feature is a column that helps me to predict my target. My target over here is species. Is there any column present over here that you feel will not help you to predict species? Is there any column like that, guys? ID, right, as Akshin mentioned. So ID column I'll draw. All the other columns I feel will help me. So the other columns I'll keep. Only ID column I feel I don't think it helps me. That is why I will drop it. Okay. So let me do that. So I'll say from my features, drop the ID column. All right, fine. And now we will have a look at our features again. Are all the feet are all the columns over here worthy to become feature columns? I feel so. So let me keep them over here. So second step done. I've extracted features and targets separately. Third step is to make sure that all the features are of numeric nature. On checking, on checking over here, I observe that all the features indeed are of numeric nature. Okay, you can see first feature column is of float type. Second feature column is of float type. Third feature column is of float type. Fourth feature column is of float type. All the feature columns are of float type. Float is nothing but one of the numeric data types, right? You would have learned it uh, in your college, maybe integer, float, right? The, all of these are numerical data types. Okay. Fine. So third step done. Feature columns are already in num of numeric nature. No need to worry. Fourth step is to make sure that features should have some rows and columns. So let's check if they have some rows and columns over here. On checking, we observe that yes, they do have some rows and columns. So that's good news. Okay. Then fifth step over here is to make sure that you split the data into two parts, training and testing. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's split the data into two parts. Okay. So for that, I'll need help of a function which I will import. From a scale on folder, there is a file called model selection. From that file, I will import this function called train test split. Now, let me go ahead and let me call this function. What are the things I'll pass? First, I'll pass my features. Then I'll pass my target. 
then I'll mention the ratio in which I want to do that train test split. So I'll say I want 20% of the rows in testing, remaining 80% I want in training. Guys, were there any other things that we used to pass in this train test split function? Anybody remembers? Akshit would remember, but anyone apart from Akshit? Saravanan would also remember, even apart from these guys. Harsha, then we have Lakshmi, Sandeep, what about you guys? What did we use to pass in this train test split function? We have already done this. We have used this function before the lunch break as well. Yes, Siddesh has mentioned correctly. Silesh, Shiv, Rachna, all of you have mentioned correctly. Random state. Wherein we used to pass that seed value. The purpose of that was to have the same rows in training and testing again and again. Okay. Anything else we used to do? One more thing. One last thing we used to do. One last thing. Correct. Silas has mentioned it. Stratification. And we used to apply stratification on our target column, right? So let's apply stratification on our target column. With this, train test split function will do its job. First, it will split your feature columns into two parts. So you'll get your features train and features test. Then it will split your target column into two parts. So you will get target train and target test. Okay, fine. So fifth step done. Six step features should be on the same scale, but it should only be done on those algorithms which involve calculation of distances between row values. Guys, currently I'm implementing an algorithm called KNN. Is KNN an algorithm where there is involvement of calculating distances? Is it an algorithm, guys, wherein there is involvement of calculating distances? What do you think? Yes, right? In this algorithm, there is involvement of calculating distances. Okay. Here I'm just setting my uh, charger wire. It seems there's some issue. Again and again, it is getting disconnected. Okay. Now it seems it's stable. Okay. So coming back to the question, as I was asking you, is this KNN algorithm algorithm where there is involvement of calculation of distances between row values? Yes. So here you will uh, do this six step. Okay. See what will happen is if you don't do this six step now, then you will have some feature columns that have higher range. And those feature columns that have higher range will contribute more in prediction as compared to feature columns that have lower range. Is there a reason why one feature column should have contributed more for prediction as compared to other feature column? No. You want each feature column to have equal importance. Okay. So uh, to avoid that situation, uh, we need to make sure that feature columns are on the same scale. So here I'll compare what is the range of values. Um, currently, let me go ahead and let me get entire description of my features. Okay. Here the minimum value is 5 and 7. Okay. So this is between 5 to 7. Here the minimum value is 3 to 4. Here the minimum, okay, minimum value is 3, maximum is 6. So 3 to 6. Here the minimum is 1, maximum is Sorry, not 3 to 6. My mistake. I should write it correctly. Minimum is 4.3, maximum is 7.9. Okay, so around 4 to 7. The second feature column has a range of 2 to 4. Third feature column has a range of 1 to 6. Fourth feature column has a range of 0 to around 2.5 or 2. So you can see they have different range. Uh, so since they do not have the same range, that means they do not have the same scale over here. Okay, so I'll need to convert them to the same scale or same range. How do we do it? Let me go ahead and let me show that to you. So guys, there are many scaling techniques. We'll use one of them over here. We will use one of them. One of the scaling techniques is called min-max scaling. Let's go ahead and let's see how it works. So guys, what it does is minimum value gets converted to zero. In simple words, just to understand, minimum values gets converted to zero. Maximum values will be converted to one. For other values, you can use this formula over here. X minus X min divided by X max minus X min. X minus X min divided by X max minus X min. Okay. 
fine so let me show you how it works uh, let me uh, employ it only on one feature column however uh, the concept will remain same regardless of how many feature columns on how many feature columns i'm applying in max query let's suppose i have one feature column only just to keep the example simple okay so let's say we have values like this 10 20 30 10 20 and what i am doing is some rows i want in training some rows i want in testing let's suppose the first three rows i want in training the remaining two rows i want in testing okay fine let's apply min max killing okay so what i will do is guys first on the training data set i will apply fitting and transformation both fitting means scanning transformation means applying the change okay fine so let's apply fitting first fitting basically means scanning okay so let's scan the training data set so guys when we scan the training data set when we scan the training data set what is the minimum value that you find in the training data set can anyone give me the answer when you scan the training data set what is the minimum value that you find 10 perfect Akshit. Similarly, Akshit, when you scan the training data set, what is the maximum value that you find? What is the maximum value that you find? Minimum value 10, maximum value 30, right? As you guys have given to me. Okay, fine. So I'll just mention that over here. Minimum 10, maximum 30. Okay, before I go ahead, it seems that charger is not connected. There's some wire related issue. It's not connected. Yeah, I guess it is overheating. Okay, fine. It seems the collection is okay now. Fine, going going back. So we are coming back to our concept. On the training data set, I applied fitting. That means scanning. That's all I've done. I have not uh, changed any value, nothing. I've just scanned the training data set. And that scanned information, I'm keeping it in my brain. Okay, now let us apply transformation. Transformation means actually applying the change. Okay, and currently I'm doing it on the training data set, remember. Okay, so let's do it. So on the training data set, you can see 10 is the minimum value, right? So that is why as per min-max scaling, it will get converted to zero. In the training data set, 30 is the maximum value. And as per the concept of min-max scaling, maximum value will get converted to one. The values that are neither minimum nor maximum will be converted using this formula. Okay. So this will be x minus x min. x is 20 minus x min. Minimum value is 10 divided by x max. Maximum value is 30 minus x min. Minimum value is 10. So this will be 10 divided by 20, which is equal to 0 0.5. Okay. So here I'll get 0 0.5. What about testing data set? Okay. Uh, here, guys, it's um, one day testing data set. I will do the same exact thing, although there will be a big problem because of that. So first we'll identify the problem, then we'll come at the solution. Okay. So just like on training data set, I applied fit and transform. On testing data set also, let's do both the things. But and then after that, let's see the problem that we'll face. So first on the testing data set, I will apply fitting. Okay. So on the testing data set, guys, fitting means scanning. So if you scan the testing data set, what is the minimum value in the testing data set? Minimum value in the testing data set, guys. What is it, Akshat? 10, right? Perfect. What is the maximum value in the testing data set? Maximum value. 20, as Shiv mentions in the chat. 20. Okay, so fitting has been done. Now let me go ahead and let me apply transformation. Okay. So let's do it. So now what I will do is uh, transformation is actually applying the change. So your 10 is the minimum value in my uh, brain and we know minimum value gets converted to zero. 20 is the maximum value that I found after scanning and we know maximum value gets converted to one. Have a look now what is happening. In the training data set, 
20 is converted to a different value. Testing in the testing data set, it is converted to a completely different value. This should not happen, guys. The conversion should be the same. If 20 is getting converted to something, it should be converted to the same value in training and testing. So how to make sure that, okay, whatever conversion happens, it happens same across training data set and testing data set. Okay. So to do that, we'll make a promise to ourselves. What is the promise? The promise is to never ever apply fitting on the testing data set. The promise is never apply fitting on the testing data set. Okay. Fitting needs to only be applied on the training data set. Once that is done, that's it. Never apply fitting on the testing data set ever. Okay. Fine. So let's go back and let's see how will it work. Okay. So I will erase all of this. And we'll start again. But this time I'm starting by making a promise to myself that okay, never ever apply fitting on the testing data set. On the testing data set, only apply transformation. On training data set, we'll apply fit and transform both. On testing data set, we'll only apply transform. Let's see whether that solves our problem or not. Currently, our problem was that a value was getting converted differently in training and testing data set. To avoid that, we made a promise that, okay, on training data set, we'll apply fit and transform both, but on testing data set, we'll only apply transformation. Okay, fine. Let's see. So on training data set, apply fit and transform both. First, let's apply fitting. Fitting means scanning. When I scan the training data set, I know minimum value is 10, maximum value is 30. Now, on the training data set, let me apply transformation. So, we know when we apply transformation, 10 is the minimum value that I got after scanning. So, it will get converted to 0. 30 is the maximum value that I got after scanning. So, it will get converted to 1. 20 is neither minimum nor maximum. So, it will get converted using this formula. Okay. So, if I apply the formula, it will come out to be 0 0.5. Okay. So, I'll just mention over here 0 0.5. Now that I've applied fitting and transformation both on training data set, let me move to testing data set. In testing data set, I've made a promise that never apply fitting on the testing data set, directly apply transformation. Let's see whether that solves our issue or not. So on the testing data set, we'll directly apply transformation. Okay, fine. So here, guys, what will happen is the value 10, uh, is it the minimum value that I got after scanning? Yes, so it will get converted to 0. The value 20, is it the minimum or maximum value that I got after scanning? No. So that is why it will get converted using this formula. So if I do it, it will be 20 minus 10 divided by 30 minus 10, which will be equal to 0 0.5. So the value 20 is getting converted to 0 0.5. And now if you see, Previously, what was happening? The value 20 was getting converted differently in training and testing data set. Now it is going to getting converted in the same exact manner. Right. So we had a problem earlier and to uh, and what was the solution to that problem? The solution was that, okay, on the training data set, we'll apply fitting and uh, transformation both, but on testing data set, we'll only apply transformation. Never ever apply fitting. Okay. But you would have a doubt, how is it related to scaling over here? And I, like this, what will happen? Um, so what are we trying to do is we are trying to make sure that we'll apply this technique on all the feature columns. And what will happen is they their values will be uh, around the range 0 to 1. Okay, around the range. The word around is important. Around the range 0 to 1. Okay. Uh, it's uh, Sometimes it might happen, guys, that... Uh, your uh, uh, transformed value can go beyond one as well. Uh, one as well. For example, uh, just to give an example to you. Okay, currently as the values are behaving between zero to one, but sometimes it can go beyond one as well. Just to give you an example. Suppose this value is instead of twenty, it is forty. Okay, so what will you do? 40 is neither minimum nor maximum value in the data set. So on that value, we'll apply this formula. So this will be 40 minus 10 divided by 30 minus 10, which is equal to 1.5. Okay, so 40 will be converted to 1.5, which is fine. 
okay because in real world also you can get some uh, strange values and it's better that you have such strange strange values in testing data set so that you can simulate that environment that okay if we get some strange values strange values means what normally in min max scaling what happens values are converted between 0 to 1 but here it's getting it's going beyond 1 so this is slightly strange and that's fine you want to simulate that environment wherein you get strange values why because in real world you will not get values as per your wish for prediction you might get strange strange values to predict on so you want to predict on the strange values so before that you want to simulate that environment in the testing data set uh, so th this is i mean uh, if you're wondering that okay if the value is going beyond 1 are we doing a mistake no this is exactly what we want okay it's better that we have these strange values in the testing data set so that we can simulate that okay in such strange environment how is the model behaving okay fine so uh, that's why i mentioned that in min max scaling what happens the values usually come in around the range 0 to 1 and this min max scaling you will apply on all the feature columns that you have okay and while applying remember on training data set you will apply fit and transform both but on testing data set you will only apply transformation okay on testing data set you will only apply transformation over here fine so let's do it i'll just make sure that my charger is connected Might be some motherboard related issue. Okay. Fine. Again, getting disconnected. Okay. Again, getting disconnected. The time. I don't know what is happening. okay fine so let's move forward guys uh, so i guess to i have uh, how much uh guys so we have to end this session now is something issue on our speaker side uh they are not getting started uh, in laptop so we have to end this session now we will continue this remaining part in our next session Guys, don't forget to fill this feedback form before leaving the session. Okay.